Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Oh boy. Here we go. British history. Hey guys, uh, preemptive, like overly sarcastic productions, great channel. The link to the original video from overly sarcastic productions, top of the description below that link to the discord. Love to have you is famous. Jesus. Uh, yeah, let's go. Uh, I thought I would honestly watched up most of these types of videos, but clearly I haven't since I, I found like four unnecessary talking. I hope you guys are all doing well. Uh, let's get started. History summarized the British Empire. Oh boy. Here we go. Here we go. British history is famously kind of impossible. The individual sagas of the Isles up to 1600 were already plenty complex on their own, but after England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland become a geopolitical megazord, those stories interlock, and then things get really tricky. But that's just the British part, because we also have the little subject of their empire, as the following four centuries see a globetrotting whirlwind of exploration and colonization that culminates in the single most cartoonishly humongous empire in human history history. So in a noble but fundamentally doomed attempts to recount the interwoven stories of Britain and her empire, oof, let's do some history. When last we left the Isles, Scotland's King James inherited the English crown in 1603 and luckily avoided being exploderized by the diabolical John Johnson and his fellow gunpowder junkies. Their plan was certainly extreme and their idiocy was correspondingly immense, but their religiously motivated discontent was broadly reflective of the public's mood. The Protestant Reformation took various shapes across Europe and this very recently, albeit loosely unified, Britain was running the full spectrum. Iron King Henry of England is legally allowed to kill his wife or whatever. I honestly do not care. I'm German. Europe and this very recently, albeit loosely unified, Britain was running the full spectrum. Ireland was still majority Catholic, Scotland was Presbyterian Protestant, and England was a right mix. The Anglican Church was firmly Protestant, but maintained Catholic-style ceremonies and administration. This sat poorly with England's Catholic and nonconformist Protestant minorities, as well as almost all Scots and Irish. A century earlier, this wouldn't have been a problem, but now that Ireland, Scotland, and England were ruled by the same king, they Sorry guys, you know, th this actually, you know, I've seen so many videos like this that it might seem redundant, okay, and it is in a lot of ways, but it highlights parts that I really want to learn more about. Like, it reminded me of the Hanseatic League I haven't learned about that I want to learn about. Um, what the heck is Presbyterianism? I always, all of the different Christian denominations confuse the heck out of me. And also, um, just the Protestant, Protestant Reformation, not a huge video, but just kind of its beginnings, it'd be nice to go over again, so. Like, and earlier, this wouldn't have been a problem, but now that Ireland, Scotland, and England were ruled by the same king, they needed to play nice. And none of them wanted to. Add to this tension that the king and parliament were now openly antagonistic, as in 1629, King Charles dismissed parliament entirely for 11 years, and when he begrudgingly brought them back to raise taxes to finance a war against Scottish Protestants, parliament allied with the Scots against the king, defeated him in war, in 1646 and executed him on charges of treason in 49. Parliament then abolished the monarchy and for the next decade they governed the Isles as a republic. Catholic Ireland disliked the fiercely Protestant English government and the Scots were understandably upset to hear that the English Parliament had murdered their Scottish king. So another round of war ensued. Scotland was straightforwardly beaten into submission but Ireland was Wait, devastated. Wait, what? That guys go forward if you need to when I what? I thought the Scottish were on board or against Scottish Protestants, Parliament, and when he begrudgingly brought them back to raise taxes to finance a war against Scottish Protestants, Parliament allied with the Scots against the King, defeated him in war in 1646, and executed him on charges of treason in 49. Parliament then abolished the monarchy, and for the next decade they governed the Isles as a republic. Catholic Ireland disliked the fiercely Protestant English government, and the Scots were understandably upset to hear that the English Parliament had murdered their Scottish King. How does that make any sense? I thought that that Scotland and, and the guys and the boys, the bo Scotland and the boys just went down and turned against Charles and then they executed him. 
Am I so missing? I'm, I'm missing something here. War ensued. Scotland was straightforwardly beaten into submission, but Ireland was devastated, with between 10 and 25 percent of the population killed and all but Jesus fully confiscated Christ. by England. And this was not the first such conquest, as King James sent British colonists to Northern Ireland to establish the Ulster plantations in 1609. By the late 1600s, Ireland was blatantly treated as a colony, not Protestant, not Britain, very exploitable. And we see that same logic applied to the Virginia colony in 1607 and other New World endeavors thereafter. Back in Britain, Lord Protector Cromwell died in 1658, and in his absence, the Republic started floundering. So here's a swerve for you. They asked the king to come back. In 1660, the Stuarts returned, but they wouldn't stay for long because Guys, King James II was... I think this is a tremendous lesson for... Or like this is this is a tremendous insight into one of the giant problems. I don't know problems with just man, just in general, humans. Is that it's like the gra the grass is always greener. Okay, right? Doesn't doesn't that saying mean like the grass is always greener on the other side? Does it, regardless of it means what I think it means? It's like. Thinking something is terrible and not realizing that, wait, it actually served a somewhat good purpose and... No, 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 not that it served. It actually contained a lot of structure that we took for granted. And it's one of the most... I, I, I'm not skipping. This is super important, I think, okay? It's fascinating to me how people look at current governments, okay? Kind of like with the rise of, uh, I'm going to upset some people, I guess, with the rise of, you know, uh, a great example is uh, the, the uh, Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx, right? In that looking at the horrible things that are happening in society and then saying that the whole society needs to be overthrown and replaced with something else only to overthrow it. And then be like, oh crap, this isn't so great either. All right. Does that make sense? And so the feeling of like, oh, we got to get it out of here. And then it's like, oh, wait. This isn't that great either. Uh, let's take the uh, market. So it's almost, it's like a healthy thing, but also kind of insane to me. It's insane that people so easily for, uh, forget the nuances or so easily take for granted a lot of stuff that that makes life pretty easy. I don't think that you should accept the bad parts, but um come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Do you know what I mean? Like and then being <clears throat> I uh, there's a much bigger point I want to make here. It's just I'm never going to be able to. Okay? The gist is that people get super angry they blame everything on everything they think that only bad things will be removed when you remove that thing only to find that a lot of good things left too and then it's kind of a healthy like therapy session of society to be like okay let's bring that back but with a little changes to uh get rid of some of the bad stuff does that make sense it's super important and fascinating to me and that's why i'm continuing to try and explain it and not really succeeding okay so started okay sorry i went on like another tirade it's too much for like three minutes started floundering so here's a swerve for you they asked the king to come back in 1660 the Stuarts returned but they wouldn't stay for long because king james ii was uh-oh super catholic so in 1688 parliament swerved uh, yet again by extending an invitation to the king's anglican daughter mary and her very protestant husband prince william of orange mr to, orange uh, throw a coup <laughs> A coup is better than an outright civil war, but Scotland and Ireland did rebel in discontent, and England brought the hammer down hard. Okay. Meanwhile, I apologize. Then I do say, like you guys are like you've never been invaded for a thousand years, and I'm like, wait, what about William of Orange? And I was just being ignorant. They they clearly invited him and wanted him to come in, so th that doesn't count. I get it.
Meanwhile, Ireland and Ireland did rebel in discontent, and England brought the hammer down hard. Meanwhile, in deposing and replacing a monarch, Parliament had all new leverage over the state, and essentially invented the concept of constitutional monarchy. The hefty political implications of that will unfold over the next few centuries, but an immediate consequence was Dutch boy William's hometown rivalry with France becoming England's business. And this geopolitical deja vu will define the long 18th century, as France and Britain compete in a second hundred years war, both in Europe and all across their brand new empires. Interesting. Inspired by the maritime mastery of Spain and Portugal, Britain sailed across the Atlantic to snag some colonies of their own, founding Virginia in 1607 and continuing with a... Guys, there I am. There I am, right there. Flurry of expeditions from the Caribbean all the way up the Atlantic coast and around Hudson's Bay. In 1664, they captured the Dutch colony of New Amsterdam, renamed it New York, and by the end of the century, Britain was running a solid operation. London and West British ports were bustling with imported furs, tobacco, cotton, and sugar. Seeing the opportunity to literally grow money, Britain took a page out of Portugal's colonial playbook and began buying up vast amounts of Africans to work as slaves over in the New World. And this was the infamous Triangle Trade. British guns and textiles pay for slaves, who then staff increasingly massive plantations, and those crops sell in Europe for boatloads of money. Rinse, repeat, buy more slaves. Africans were- Why is the Hudson Bay highlighted? I'd imagine most of the year it'd be frozen, right? sell in Europe for boatloads of money. Rinse, repeat, buy more slaves. Africans were treated as little more than the raw materials of empire. Company. Overworked, given nothing, and brutally abused. A fifth would die crossing the Atlantic, and the average life expectancy upon arrival was just seven years. This was almost abhorrent enough to make people think twice before they remembered how obscenely rich it was making them. Slaves made money, money made armies, armies made empire. Rinse, repeat, Buy more slaves. In Britain, this cycle paid for improvements in government bureaucracy and overhauled all of finance with innovations like the central bank. And during the 1700s, these early successes just kept on compounding. 1702, France tries out for the Spanish crown and Britain makes them pay for it with Newfoundland and Spanish Nova Scotia. Succession. Plus, they take Gibraltar from Spain, so now Britain decides who gets in and out of the Mediterranean. 1740, Britain dunks on the French Navy because they can. 1754, British and French colonists fight over who gets North America, and two years later, all of Europe Europe is throwing hands at each other. Britain's massive pocketbooks let them throw infinity money at the problem, so they take French Quebec and the Mississippi River Valley, push France out of India, and with this field to themselves, begin steamrolling all of India. The Seven Years' War doubled the size of the British Empire and knocked out every outside threat, so now they just needed to keep it together. And naturally they didn't. See, when the British imposed new taxes on stamps and tea to pay for the ludicrously expensive war they just fought, American colonists were furious to be treated like gas. A colony. So they started asking the philosophical. Wow, uh, what a, the intolerable accent. What? <laughs> questions gas right, he put that in a, a funny colony. way so they started asking the philosophical questions at the heart of self-determination such as hey king george what's the opposite of tea yeet <laughs> worse yet france was egging them on and then they got ideas of course the french revolution is a philosophical and political doozy all on its own but what matters for us is that france threw down the gauntlet with basically everyone and conquered nearly all of mainland europe i, I wonder like or is that the first yet? I, I, do you think that it's because, like, he because he put it funny, like they're treating us like wait a colony, which they are, but it, it seems like the ratio of of white British people to natives there, because you know the stuff that happened, you know, manifesting. Well, no, that was that later, but anyways, so maybe they're like. Okay, like, we all look British, but we're still being treated like a colony, and so they were... Maybe that was a... Am I grasping at straws here? Yet, France was egging them on, and then they got ideas. Of course, the French Revolution is a philosophical and political doozy all on its own, but what matters for us is that France threw down the gauntlet with basically everyone and conquered nearly all of mainland Europe. Britain withstood a continental trade embargo and even blocked an attempted invasion, but their greatest weapon was Napoleon's own hubris, as his empire evaporated in 1815 and the Second Hundred Years' War was firmly in the books. 
Point Britain. While the Empire was gearing up to become the master of the world, Britain still needed to be the master of itself, and that was a tricky prospect. After the revolution of 1688, Catholic and pro-Stuart uprisings in Ireland and later in Scotland threatened to untie the delicate knot that kept the kingdoms together. So England solved the issue by two means, legal mechanisms and violence. In 1707, England formally unified with Scotland to create the Kingdom of Great Britain, and again in 1800 to create the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. What was once a complex web of personal unions and technically independent states were now just the same kingdom. Nice and easy. This was enforced forcefully as a slew of penal laws in Ireland systematically deprived Catholics of property, religious freedom, and political rights. These laws were repealed in the late 1700s and early 1800s, but as we see with the unchecked devastation of the potato famine in the middle of the century, the government still didn't really care all that much? As is the case from earlier, Scotland got off quite a bit easier. While the agriculture of the Highlands was entirely overhauled, with mass evictions, the complete disassembling of the clan system, and a little titch of cultural erasure, the cities in the south had a grand old time. As Ed Nice painting. Uh, the cultural and linguistic anglification of the Isles is a thorny topic. The Highland clearances are one of many active scholarly debates. This demands a little titch of cultural erasure. The cities in the south had a grand old time, as Edinburgh was the brains of the empire and Glasgow's ships were the heart of Britain's maritime power. And speaking of power, the turn of the century brought the Industrial Revolution, which gave Britain the tools and the technologies to single-handedly dunk on the entire rest of the planet. The advent of mechanized industry and steam power changed the lives of everyday Britons by bringing them affordable consumer goods while cramming them into cities and, in the case of the poor, factories. But that in turn made Britain the manufacturer to the world and increasingly its owner. With cool new gizmos like steamships, Britain could hold a network of colonies no matter how far they were. To reach the vast riches of India, British sailors could pass along Sierra Leone, St. Helena, the Cape Colony, Mauritius, and the Maldives. But by the end of the century, after the Suez Canal opened, you could pass Gibraltar, Malta, Cyprus, Egypt, Aden, and Somaliland, and then keep going past India to Malaysia, Singapore, Australia, and New Zealand without once making port on a coast that didn't belong to Queen Victoria. In 1921, you could walk from South Africa to Mesopotamia and never leave British territory. You can almost, if a few gaps are filled, like, you know, the, the southern coast of Iran, not, not like that's a small gap, right? And then a little bit here, you can, you can walk from, like, Cape Town to Singapore. That's crazy. <laughs> The raw scope and diversity of locales at play here is frankly absurd, as it's dizzying to distinguish what's behind this blanket of red draped over a quarter of the world. And while that diversity found its way into Britain itself through communities and art and food from all over, it raises some rather thorny questions about belonging and ownership. Guys, question. Do you think that the British... You can even say America nowadays, but I don't think America nowadays is as strong in comparison. When I say as strong, I mean like your ability to to bully the entire world, right? America can and does do that quite often sometimes. But I, I think that because of, you know, technology and, and, you know, people worrying more about human rights and everything than they did in the times of the British Empire or the Roman Empire. So I'm not going to include America right now, uh, unless you think so. But I wonder if you think in proportion to the known world at their respective times, do you think the British or the Roman Empire was more powerful? As in, of the known world, they could influence stuff more. Does that make sense? I'd be curious what you guys think there. And while that diversity found its way into Britain itself through communities and art and food from all over, it raises <laughs> some rather thorny questions about belonging and ownership. There was a tangible dissonance between the idea of all these disparate cultures coming together and the reality of Britain sitting at the top. Still, British and other European empires knew that outright colonization was not necessary to squeeze out wealth, and the prime example is China, which Britain ransacked in the Opium Wars to get better trading rights and a tiny little island called Hong Kong. Because why bother colonizing all of China when you can just smack them into letting you trade whatever and wherever you want? Having a powerful navy so overpowered, so insanely overpowered. I, I say this all the time, all right? You can block trade, 
you can do you can bombard 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 ports and people can't do anything about it what are you gonna do try and sail through their navy to like get retaliation or like swim to the boats with swords or and guns of course keeping these far or, or use it's just that it's so overpowered that actually might push them over the Roman. You can just smack I don't know. them into letting you trade whatever and wherever you want. Of course, keeping these far-flung territories safe from other prying empires produced a cycle of take it now so no one else can, leaving the Europeans to carve up all of Africa in just 20 years. Auto. As we know, it wasn't long before they pointed those carving knives at each other, and so the world wars happen. Yes, they're very important. We're not getting into it. What matters to Britain is that although it did win both wars, it lost heavily heavily in that process. Despite scoring some prizes from the losing empires along the way, it became clear that these colonies, which fought so hard for the British cause and were sometimes in the theaters of war themselves, needed the big reward. Much of the British public was for this, as the wheels of national sovereignty had been turning since Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa became self-governing dominions around the turn of the century, and the Republic of Ireland gained independence in 1922. But after the Second World War, those ideas were finally trickling out to the other colonies. So over the next few decades, the empire dismantled itself, mostly non-militarily, but very irresponsibly. As a rule, Britain didn't care where they drew the borders, nor how bad of a mess they left behind. Exhibit A, India. This continued through the 1900s and culminated, somewhat tragically, with the handover of Hong Kong to China in 1997. Built from the Bangladesh and Pakistan, I believe both of which are in the top 10 most populated countries on the planet. And of course, India is now number one. We're all a single country. Somewhat tragically, with the handover point. of Hong Kong to China in 1997. Built from the ground up in the span of a century and a half, Hong Kong had an... Or a single territory, I should China say. ...in 1997. Built from the ground up in the span of a century and a half, Hong Kong had an international identity and a true blend of cultures that, despite centuries of lofty ambitions, no other colony had ever achieved. Far be it from me, of all people, to bemoan the death of the British Empire, but I will mourn Hong Kong. Meanwhile, in the closing hours of the century, the United Kingdom allowed Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland to form their own parliaments and govern themselves more directly. What that means for the future of Britain? <laughs> We're not there yet. And that... Whew, is the history of the British Empire. What it all meant and what we should take away from it are the subjects of vigorous academic and public debate. I can go on and on from my comfy top-down perspective, but the consequences of this history play out in the lives of billions of people, in the Isles and around the world. It's constitutional government, industrialization, global networks, bitter post-colonial rivalries, treasures missing from their home cultures, and a very, very contested picture of British identity. Who belongs? Who benefits. Even just inside of Britain, that is a lot to unpack. And with a topic as broad as the British Empire, there are no universal answers. <sighs> what can I say? Therapy. That's empire for you. Thank you for watching. This video was Thanks a for long making. time coming, and I hope that I was able to do some justice to a subject as broad and complex as this. Good job Thanks, in 12 and a half always, minutes. to our community of patrons who support the work we do, and an extra special thank you to our community members on Discord who helped me fine-tune my script. I'll see you all in the next video. Great channel, great video. Uh, sorry if I went on a few rants there. I even had to cut out one. Like, I kept going. <laughs> like five minutes it's the thing that i really care about guys because it's so, the the overstepping that we do when we when we get rid of a uh structure a governmental structure or whatnot that we see as problematic without realizing the things built in like sometimes i think we need to stop and appreciate hmm <laughs> a hospital like just a hospital or or knowing that you can't just like be dragged into like someone can't just like say i don't like you you're going to jail right it just just stuff like that 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 government promotes and, and guys i'm i it, 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 i can already hear like well you know you you don't have free health care and stuff i'm not talking about that level right of discussion here just have like the basic levels things we have in society a sewage system okay internet electricity cables that go into houses uh, 
like sometimes I, it's I think it's extremely important, like, extremely important to think about to obviously critique society, okay? But think but not go so uh, often in times when society screws up so much, a government screws up so much, the loudest and craziest voices end up rising to the top and then formulating the next thing, which ends up being equally insane. And, and then I just think this is a great example. The, you know, getting rid of Charles, having Cromwell and then wanting the, after Cromwell, wanting the monarchy back is just, uh, it encapsulates something that I think about it's a lot, I think, or is, I think, important and is super dangerous to forget it. You know, does that make sense? Hope you guys are all doing well. Uh, sorry if I talked too much there and I'll see you guys next time. Bye guys. Would appreciate any comments. Bye.